You're listening to the expository preaching ministry of Kootenai Community Church, located in Kootenai, Idaho. We pray that Christ is exalted and your spirit is blessed by the teaching of God's Word. For more information about Kootenai Church, please visit us online at kootenaichurch.org. So last week, there were two questions. Where is Carchemish? And um, the timeline, a little bit of the timeline, this has been an interesting week for me, so I didn't get to them. <laughs> I don't know if you all got the prayer chain or not, but between the crazy campaign and the passing of my father-in-law, I didn't get to it. So I will, because I need to know where Carchemish is so I can put it in my GPS, so I don't end up there when I'm trying to go to Coeur d'Alene or something. <clears throat> Is that, yeah, I think it's probably somewhere over in Mesopotamia. So this morning, let's open by reading um, chapter 1, um, the first, we'll read the first 13 verses of, of Daniel chapter 1. <clears throat> Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 through 13. <clears throat> Give us our introduction and our context. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasury of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his officials, to bring in some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family and of the nobles, youths in whom was no defect, who were good-looking, showing intelligence in every branch of wisdom, endowed with understanding and discerning knowledge, who had the, who, and who had ability for serving in the king's court. And he ordered him to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed for them a daily ration from the king's choice food and from the wine which he drank, and appointed that they should be educated three years, at the end of which they were to enter, enter the king's personal service. Now among them, from the sons of Judah, were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Then the commander of the officials assigned new names to them, and to Daniel he assigned the name Belteshazzar, and to Hananiah, Shadrach, and to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine he drank, which he drank. So he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. Now, God granted Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the commander of the officials. And the commander of the officials said to Daniel, I'm afraid if my lord the king, who has appointed your food and your drink, for why should he see your faces looking more haggard than the youths who are your own age? Would you make me forfeit my head to the king? But Daniel said to the overseer, whom the commander of the officials had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for ten days, and let us be given some vegetables to eat, and water to drink. Then let our appearance be observed in your presence and the appearance of the youths who are eating the king's choice food and deal with your servants according to what you see. <laughs> a lot in this first chapter and a lot, again, as we talked about before, that's left unsaid. And remember, the critics will look at every single jot and tittle and try and figure out a way to criticize and drag down the book of Daniel, as they do most of the Bible, if not all of it except for the one verse that they love, judge not. They leave that one alone. So we, we went through, we, we finished the introduction months back, and then last week we went through, verse, we went through verses 1 and 2. Um, so we discovered that the narrative sense of description was used, and that's why Daniel would call Nebuchadnezzar king when he conquered that area, even before he was king. And that was one of the critics... Um, complaints. We looked at the locate, the fact that there was geographically was the location of the Tower of Babel and some of the other cons- inconsistencies, but the mo- for the most part, we reveled in the fact that God's Word is very, is totally consistent. And, uh, with that said, as a, a bit of an introduction to the first, to la- you know, reminding us about last week, we'll just jump right into verse three and sca- slide 3233. <laughs> so, Daniel chapter 1, verse 3. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his officials, to bring in some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family of the nobles. Now this is a description of the fulfillment 
direct fulfillment of a prophecy of Isaiah in chapter 39 of, of Isaiah, where it says, Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming that is in your house, and all your fathers have laid up in store to, to this day will be carried to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. And some of your sons who will issue from you, whom you will beget, will be taken away, and they will become officials in the palace of the king of Babylon. Now, that's a pretty startling and accurate prediction that Isaiah made. And uh, it's, it comes to fruition. It is fulfilled in this part of the scriptures where Daniel and the sons of Judah, Jehoiakim is conquered, and those, all of those people are taken to Babylon to become, to become just what it says, um, to become servants, to become officials in the palace of the king of Babylon. And that's exactly what they're headed for doing. Now, so these young people, these youths, would have been between the ages of 15 and 20 years. They would have been in excellent physical condition, handsome, and intellectually superior. They were to be taught in the writings and language of the Chaldeans who were of the privileged class in Babylon, the same class to which belonged the kings of Babylon. Likely, they would be taught astronomy, astrology, mathematics, natural history, mythology, agriculture, architecture, and they would have studied the ancient languages of Babylon. This training would last about three years, and it would prepare these young men to become officers in the king's court, just as Isaiah's prophecy specified. So the four young men that we're introduced to in the beginning of this book are well known in Christian circles. The first would be Daniel, whose name meant God is judge. His name was changed, as were the other Uh, young men's changed, and and those names were changed specifically to honor the gods of Babylon. If they were going to be officials in the court of the king, then their names needed to reflect um, subservience to the gods of Babylon. I That would have been a difficult thing for me to be named after, I mean, my name's strange enough as it is, to be named after some Babylonian god. Um, You know, can't you just call me Bill, you know? But this isn't, wasn't to happen. The four young men we were introduced to, uh, were, their names were changed. He was, Daniel was given the name Belteshazzar to be distinguished from the next king, Belshazzar. His name was Belteshazzar, which is to be distinguished from that. And his name means Bel protect his life or the lady protect his life. This was one of the chief Babylonians gods, Bel. There's actually a, um, uh, an apocryphal book written in around this time, or no, later on, but de- de- describes this time called Bell and the Dragon. It almost sounds like a child's, a children's fairy tale. Actually, it is. <laughs> so, yeah, it is a fairy tale. So Bell was one of the chief Babylonian gods. Hananiah, whose name meant Jehovah is gracious, was given the name Shadrach, connoting command of Aku, another Babylonian god, the moon god Babylon of Babylon. Mishael, actually, his name actually expressed a question. Who is what God is, or who is like God? And his name was changed to Mishak, which is, who is Aku? Which is another reference to the moon god. And then finally, Azariah, Jehovah has helped. His name meant Jehovah has helped. Was named Abednego, servant of Nebo. He was named after the Babylonian god Nebo, with Nego being a corrupted spelling. So these young men's names were given to them by their parents and expressed devotion to their God, to Jehovah God. They very likely, very likely came from devout Jewish families who loved the Lord and who served him in various ways. So what happens here is the captors hoped that their mindset would be changed by receiving these new names and they would begin to take on responsibility to and be loyal to the Babylonian gods. It wasn't just a name change just for the sake of different letters. It was to confer on these young men the idea that you now serve us, you now serve the Babylonian gods, act like it. And so we're going to see that all four of these young men do a great job of serving the king as they should have, but they didn't do it to the disrespect of Jehovah. (laughs) It cannot be overemphasized the amount of pressure these young men would have been under to knuckle under and to conform to this strange pagan culture. The the pressure would have been immense. Everybody around him was doing it. All of their teachers did it. The king was that way. They lost the war. God, 
they were delivered into the hands of these people who were uh, pagan as pagan can be and vicious, a vicious culture, very, very perverted and vicious culture. He, they had no family, 15 year old, turned loose in a pagan, not turned loose, captured and put in a pagan culture, no family around him, no support, no, no loved ones. Matter of fact, many of them might have seen their loved ones killed. <laughs> they were uprooted from their homeland. They were young and living in a completely strange environment that they could most likely not even understand. Um, unlikely that they were given any instruction at home about some of these pagan cultures. The Israelites didn't do that. They taught their children about God, about the one, Je- about Jehovah God. So they would have had no point of reference. I, I can't em- emphasize enough how difficult this would have been. It wasn't just like going to grandma's and getting homesick for gram- for mom. This was, they had nothing to sustain them. So Reynolds Showers says in his commentary, he says, um, they were only teenagers subjected to the authority of the most powerful adult ruler on earth. It appeared that their God had been humiliated. They were put under the instruction of elite but ungodly teachers, men who were regarded as the world's top scholars. Do your research. Believe the science. Where we've heard that. They were a situation that could be deadly for the faith of impressionable teenagers. Their education exposed them to such anti-God subjects as astrology and pagan mythology. They were placed in the enviable position of gaining favorable government posts if they would cooperate fully with their rulers, with their captors. They were afforded what many would have regarded as a great privilege, the eating of the king's fare. With the change of names, one of the major things that had been given them, that had given them personal identity since birth was removed. One, was their commitment to Jehovah strong enough to withstand this onslaught of pressure? One aspect of the pressure provided a specific test that would tell, namely the giving of the king's food to the students. And it's hard for us, I'll I'll continue reading here in a minute, but it's hard for us to comprehend how difficult this would have been because the eating of that food in that culture was obedience to the gods that that food was sacrificed to. Eating the fare of the Gentile king posed a twofold problem for a Jew faithful to Jehovah. First, it contained food that God in the Mosaic in the Mosaic Covenant, the Mosaic Law had forbidden the Jews to eat. Second, the king's food was offered as a sacrifice to the Babylonian gods before it was eaten. To, to the Babylonian way of thinking, to eat that food was to participate in the worship of their gods. Thus, if a Jew were to eat the king's fare, he would appear to have forsaken Jehovah for the worship of idols. That was no small thing in the minds of these young men who had been raised to devoted to Jehovah God. So now, <clears throat> the word for officials, where it says, then the king ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his officials, can also be translated eunuch. Because of this, some scholars have believed that the Hebrew youths were castrated. Josephus assumes this to be the case. Verse 4 indicates, however, it says, youths in whom was no defect. Verse 4 uh, indicates, however, that the youth had no defect. This would militate against the idea that they were castrated, and it is very unlikely that they were. It was unnecessary to do that. Not all officials were so rendered. The word Cyrus can indeed mean eunuch, but it is also used of Potiphar, who was a married man. So there, it's not ex- uh, exclusively used of that that situation. It's used to, to uh, denote someone as an actual official. It was just that often... The officials were castrated. In yet another attempt by liberals to discredit the book, the word translated nobles comes from the Persian um, partemim. This, they say, indicates a later date for Daniel. <laughs> the simple explanation that seems to escape them is that Daniel served as, as an official in the Persian king's court. And so using Persian words would not be unusual at all. In fact, scholars have not concluded for certain that the word is Persian in the first place, and it has an uncertain etymology. So my son, when he was born, had an an affliction in his mother's womb. And that affliction is called spina bifida occultus. 
That is the word of the medical, that is the language of the medical community. Now, let me translate that for you. There's a number of ways to translate it. Um, it depends on how elaborate you want to get based on how much you know about the conditions that it causes in people that have it later on in life. Spina bifida occulta simply means a cutting of the spine in the dark. A cutting of the spine in the dark. That's what it means. But here's what translation actually means. Sometime while Nick was in his mom's womb, something happened to his spine and busted something in his spine, in his uh, nervous system. There's your true translation. <laughs> so when he came out, part of his nervous system didn't function the way it was supposed to. But you don't get that just from spina bifida occultus. <laughs> there. Now you all know Latin. <laughs> so this is not uncommon in any culture to use languages of specific categories or specific, um, um, uh, I'm trying to think of the word, but like mathematics has its own language, engineering has a language, medicine has a language, the law, the law, legal, have, they have their own language. Um, I remember researching some stuff. Well, I'm getting way off track, getting way off in the rabbit's trail. This is just not uncommon in any age. And to to say that it places Daniel later is just, grabbing at straws. Another aspect, uh, it should be noted that another aspect of their captivity would be that they would be hostages. They would actually be hostages to this to this uh, um, kingdom. And it would be far less likely that the royal family left in Jerusalem would attempt anything, would attempt any kind of a rescue or anything. Um, plus, it seems like it really just took the wind out of the Jewish sails at this time in history. So any comments or questions about verse 3? So now here in verse 4, it says, youths. So verse 3 was, uh, then the king ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of, his offic- chief of his officials, to bring in some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family and of the nobles. Youths, verse 4 says, in whom was no defect, who were good-looking, showing intelligence in every branch of wisdom, endowed with understanding and discerning knowledge, and who had ability for serving in the king's courts. And he ordered them, to, he ordered him to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. So these young men, the word youths comes from the Hebrew for a lad, a boy, a child. They were handsome and intelligent, but not simply in schoolwork. They would have been young men who had demonstrated the ability for critical reasoning and logic. They would have been the kind of young people who would study their studies, and out of that, they had become, in their own right, people who could critically reason to a logical conclusion about different things. So, and you all, yes, Nathal. Um, they would have just, at some point, they would have observed them, watched them, talking to each other. That's one thing. And then more than likely, now this is a guess, this is a sanctified guess, the officials would have interviewed them. So this is, we're, we're, we're compressing a lot of happenings into four verses here. <laughs> so they would have, they would have, Peter, oh, how would they have known that they were intelligent is the question. And the answer, at least as much as I can come up with, because I, I wondered about that, they, they would have probably, during the time in their early captivity, they would have been interviewed. Uh, they would have been asked lots of questions. They would have been observed in their inter- interactions with each other and in their inter- interactions with their captors. You can learn a lot about a person that way. You can see You can see which ones are sheep and which ones aren't. It kind of surprises me that these guys were singled out in some ways, because their captors had to have said, I don't think these guys are going to go along to get along. We'll see what happens. Maybe they like that. Maybe they like the challenge. The captors did. I don't know. Yeah. They were sons of noblemen. So the assumption would be that they had received the best training that their culture could give them as well. Yes. So they would have also needed to be able to serve the king, in, serve in the king's court, which implied physical capability. They were to be instructed in the learning of the Chaldeans. This reference could have been to the Chaldeans as a whole or to a class of learned men within that nation, within the nation of Babylon. So it is likely that at this time in the Babylonian Empire's history, the Chaldeans were a class of learned men Um, In Daniel chapter 2, it says this, verse 2, Then the king gave orders to call in the magicians, the conjurers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king. So they're a class of teacher, um, savant, 
um, um, upper, upper crust person in this, in this, uh, empire. They were the, they were the class of learned men who were entrusted with the wisdom of the Babylonians. So this description of the Chaldeans comes from Smith's Bible Dictionary. It appears that the Chaldeans were in the earliest times merely one out of many Cushite tribes inhabiting the great alluvial plain known afterwards as Chaldea or Babylonia. Their special seat was probably that southern portion of the country which is found to have so late retained the name of Chaldea. In process of time, as they as the Chaldee grew in power, their name gradually prevailed over those of the other tribes inhabiting the country. And by the era of the Jewish captivity... They had begun to be used generally for all of the, it had begun to be used generally for all of the inhabitants of Babylonia. It appears that while both in Assyria and in later Babylonia, the Shemitic type of speech prevailed for civil purposes, the ancient Cushite dialect was retained as a learned language for scientific and religious literature. This is no doubt the, quote, learning and tongue to which reference is made in the book of Daniel, in Daniel 1-4. The Chaldeans were really the learned class. They were the priests, magicians, astronomers, and in the last of the three capabilities, they probably affected discoveries of great importance. In later times, they seem to have degenerated into mere fortune tellers. And so in the history of their, of their, their activities, they went from the learned class down to gypsies, I guess, or fortune tellers. Any questions about verse four comments? Verse five. And here's where it gets difficult for Daniel and his four friends. <laughs> the king appointed for them a daily ration from the king's choice food and from the wine which he drank and appointed that they should be educated three years at the end of which they were to enter the king's personal service. So the appointment of food was actually from the very larder or stores of food that the king himself partook of. It is not to be misunderstood as possibly some liberal critics would would under, misunderstand that the king himself did this. Rather, it was part of the responsibilities of his underlings that took care of those being trained for service in the kingdom. They would have appointed the king's food to these young men. The education period was specifically designed for boys of this age group so that they would come out of it properly trained, properly prepared for actual service to the king. Their service would be in the areas of advice, legal issues, science, literature, and any other areas that the king might require for himself individually or for service to the kingdom. It was actually considered a special honor to be given a portion of the king's food. Honors directly from the king given in Babylon were not taken lightly. Disregarding them or refusing them often carried the death penalty. (laughs) I, I would really rather not have that diet pop. Bang. I don't know that that happens here yet, but <laughs> some of us might have had parents. Well, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Their service, uh, so disregarding or refusing them did carry, did carry the death penalty. Remember the story in Esther where simply speaking in the king's presence without him acknowledging you or giving you the right to speak could result in death. Esther was afraid to go in to talk with King Ahasuerus because he hadn't He hadn't uh, talked with her or met with her in in quite a bit of time. It was months, if I remember right. And her uncle said to her, well, you were born for such a time as this. And so she decided she called on the rest of the the country to pray and fast. And she went in before Hazuerus, knowing that if if he didn't point his scepter at her and grant her an audience to, you couldn't even go in. If he didn't grant her audience to speak, she could be killed. It was not a light thing to disagree with the king in those days. Today, we we take it for granted. We have free speech. They didn't. They didn't have anything like that. There were no freedoms like that in this kingdom. You could be killed just for disagreeing with the king. And when I say disagreeing, he likes broccoli. Huh, you're dead. I don't think I'm exaggerating. They They could be that petty. Tyrants can be that petty. So... Any other questions or comments about verse 5? Verse 6. Now among them, among all these youths that were brought in, among all these captives, all the people that were captured and brought to Babylon, <laughs> were the, from the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So clearly by the wording of this verse, 
there were a lot of youths appointed to the king's service. Apparently, there were even quite a few more from the tribe of Judah, from the sons of Judah alone. Later, when each of these four young men were faced with choices they had to make regarding faithfulness to their God, it is notable that they are the only four who stood against the pagan influences of Babylon. Who says one person can't make a difference? Or just a couple of people can't make a difference? This is a beautiful um, um, acknowledgement of that fact, that if you will bet, you will but stand for what is right, you can make a difference. And Daniel and his four, three friends do. The general consensus is that the corrupting influences of Babylon, as well as the danger of according any resistance to the Babylonian edicts had already worked their pernicious designs on the rest of the young captives. It is indeed possible that out of all of those people, only four stood up against the destructive effects of the pagan culture. Daniel's contemporary, the prophet Ezekiel, mentions Daniel in his book. Interesting mention, Ezekiel 14, 14. Even though these three men in their particular time of history, Noah, Daniel, and Job were in its midst by their own righteousness. They could not, they could only deliver themselves, declares the Lord God. And then in 1420 of Ezekiel, even though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in its midst as I live, declares the Lord God, they could not deliver either their son or their daughter. They would deliver only themselves by their righteousness. Their effect, however, later on, affected all of the Jewish nation. And Ezekiel 28.3, Behold, you are wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that is a match for you. So Ezekiel knew about Daniel, his contemporary, in the very same pagan culture that he'd been captured and brought into. And it would be quite natural for Ezekiel to do this. As a captive himself, it would have been notable to him that one of his contemporaries had risen to a position of power in the Babylonian Empire. The critics that object to this offer as their only evidence that they believe that Daniel is a second century forgery, and thus Ezekiel can't be referring to this Daniel. (laughs) No, this was written later. Why? Well, because it was. And therefore, they can't be referring to Daniel, this Daniel. For, For reference sake, just so we know, just for reference purposes, there are three other Daniels mentioned in Scripture. In 1 Chronicles... 3.1. 3.1. Now these were the sons of David who were born to him in Hebron. The firstborn was Ammon by, Hino, by, Hino, by Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess. The second was Daniel by Abigail, the Carmelitess. <clears throat> and the second mention of a Daniel, the son of Ithamar, Ezra 8.2. Of the sons of Phineas, Gershom. Of the sons of Ithamar, Daniel. Of the sons of David, Hattush. And then a priest is mentioned in the time of Nehemiah with the name Daniel, Nehemiah 10.6. He names Daniel, Ginnathon, and Barak. So just, so just for those purposes, I just want everybody to be aware that there are three other Daniels mentioned in Scripture. They are not the Daniel that this is talking about, that this book was written by. No one assumes Ezekiel is talking about one of those. And the implication that he is talking about a Daniel mentioned in the Rosh Shamra text written 1500 to 1200 BC is completely absurd and incorrect. And again, it is based on assumptions. Daniel couldn't have been written back then. The prophecies are too accurate. Therefore, it was written later. Therefore, he must be talking about a guy from 1200 BC. Next question. That's not the kind of reasoning that Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or Mishael, Hannah, uh, the, the three holy children would have come to. They would have reasoned better than that. Any questions about verse 6? Verse 7. Then the commander of the officials assigned new names to them. And to Daniel, he assigned the name Belteshazzar. (coughs) Uh, To Hananiah, Shadrach. To Mishael, Meshach. And to Azariah, Abednego. As mentioned earlier, The Babylonian officials changed these men's names from Hebrew names that glorified and honored the God of Israel to names that would reflect the glory of the gods of Babylon. This was one of the actions that an ancient conqueror would take, would affect, in order to demonstrate sovereignty over captives. He owned the captives. They weren't just his advisors. They were his slaves. They were his objects of ownership. And he had the power of life and death in their hand for any reason. Because each of these four men's name in Hebrew is some way honored Jehovah God, it is likely, as I pointed out earlier, that they came from godly families. This would have contributed greatly to their ability to stand firm against the pagan culture. So because 
when we look at ancient words, there's usually a pool of meanings. Sometimes you'll get a little bit different reference about names. So Daniel, God is my judge, goes to Belteshazzar, which is Bel, save the king, or Bel, protect the king. Well, Bel was a lady goddess, lady, protect the king. Hanani, Yahweh is gracious to Shadrach. I am very fearful of God, um, or command of... Uh, Jehovah is gracious to command of Aku. To, to, to observe a command is to fear someone and do what they tell. So that's the pool of words that comes up with those two little bit of different. And then uh, who is what God is? Meshach, I am of little account. Same thing. Compared to God, what are we? Nothing. And so that is reflected in that other suggested translation of the third, of the third young man's name. So... All kinds of interesting information about that, but when you look up the meaning of names, um, and I'm sure all of you have, or most of you, if not all of you have, when you named your children, sometimes people don't, and they find out later on what the name means. They go, whoops, I didn't want to name him that. <laughs> so you come up with a creative alternative. But uh, all that aside, any questions about verse 7? Comments? So verse 8. Now here's where here's where... It's God is so economical. He puts he, he he gives us so much truth in so few words. Behind these words are the the fear and the concern and the bravery that comes out when these three young men make a decision. Four young men, excuse me, make a decision to continue to honor Jehovah God, knowing that it could mean the end of their lives in a painfully horrifying way. Verse 8, but Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine which he drank. So he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. So in an example that would be taken up by his three friends later, Daniel literally, it says that he laid upon his own heart. He laid upon his own heart, made up his mind, the decision not to defile himself with food and drink that had been offered to idols and that did not properly meet the Mosaic laws and guidelines for food. This is in contrast to the situation in the Corinthians where the New Testament had devolved them of the responsibility to the ceremonial law. Daniel and his friends were indeed obligated. They were obligated to the Mosaic law. In Daniel's situation, if he did not eat the food, he ran the risk of angering the officials who with the king's sanction could kill him. If he did eat the food, he would offend God. He could have made excuses since he was in the, he was in the unique situation of being in captivity. He could, so quote, you know, think of the impact we can have for Jehovah since we're in such important positions. All we have to do is eat a little food and drink some wine that they provide for us. It's a fair trade off for the impact we can have on this culture. What happens to your impact on others? when you make a compromise at the beginning of your potential. So you, right after that compromise, get stronger and begin to do what's right again? Or does it usually lead to a whole series of compromises that you begin to devolve down into what you never thought you would? Daniel knew this. Even at his young age, this is remarkable. So he didn't make any excuses. Ah. He might have been concerned that if he didn't eat the food, it might cost the lives of the officials that were put over him. But he determined to remain true to everything God required, both morally and ceremonially. In this particular case, the outward ceremonial purity that Daniel maintained was an evidence of the inward moral purity he had maintained within. Now, the phrase choice food, choice food, is from a, is from a Persian word which means both the provision of meat and it means a dainty. So I'm thinking like, this would have been the really fancy foods that probably most of us can't afford. You know, if fish eggs cost $46 an ounce, I'm going to eat a hamburger. So the phrase, it comes from a Persian word, another Persian word. These were special cuts and portions that the king himself would eat. And they more often than not were used in special ceremonies to the Babylonian deities. Thus, they were foods offered to the idols in the most real sense. They were specially set aside for idol worship. And it would have been well known. In this, in this context, Daniel's decision to maintain his purity was not done in a fanatical display of religious fervor. He didn't come uncorked at the officials screaming at them that he would remain true to his God and you could do whatever you want. And I'm just not going to, I'm not going to do that. 
He didn't do that. He was a thoughtful young man. He was a critical thinker, and he was a child of God. <laughs> he sought permission on the commander, to the commander of the officials to be exempted from partaking of the food and drink offered. So it was important to Daniel and his friends to stay true to the responsibilities they had before the Lord God Jehovah. If they compromised in this area, they would be unusable in the days and months and years to come. And they knew that. I believe they knew that. Now, that's taking a, hopefully a sanctified insight into the verse. I'm not saying that that's written here, okay? But uh, H.A. Ironside in his commentary said this. The only way you can advance in the truth is by maintaining a good conscience. Allow one thing in your life unjudged that you know to be contrary to the word of God or that you fear is not in line with God's word, God's will for you, and you will soon find your spiritual eyes have become darkened, your spiritual susceptibilities deadened, and no real progress made in your soul, but rather a steady decline. But where there is faithfulness in separation from that which is opposed to the mind of God, where his word is allowed to sit in judgment on all your ways, you will learn that, quote, the path of the just is as a shining light, which shineth brighter and brighter under the perfect day, unquote. The word will illumine each step before you as you take the one already pointed out. I'm not talking about legalism. I'm talking about obedience to what you know God's word says. We can't know everything God's Word says, and we can't understand everything God's Word says. There's a lot I don't know. There's a lot I don't understand. But there's an awful lot that I don't misunderstand, that I actually have to make effort to misunderstand. And I think that's true of all of us. And in this particular case, they understood what was required of them, and they made the decision not to conform to the Babylonian edicts. Daniel's decision also demonstrates that he understood that God had brought the Israelites into captivity because of their failure to observe the law. He couldn't make the decisions and the suggestions and give the orders. He was under the authority of others who were making the decisions and giving the orders. And he appealed to them in a proper way. So we're going to, rather the next verse has, well, we'll we'll do verse 9 really quickly, but any questions about verse 8? Yes, Nathel. Yes. So they would have wanted food was all of the king's food dedicated to the idols. They would have wanted food from a different store. I would think so. I would think so that anything that came out of the, out of the king's stores, it was a, it was a special store of food that the king partook of and his partaking of it continually, daily evidenced his, uh, devotion to the Babylonian gods. So they wanted it from, they didn't want to get their food from Fred Myers. They wanted to get it from Walmart or something. You know, that's that's a poor analogy, but I think you get it. <laughs> yes, Melvin. So, yeah, actually the word is added. He sought from the commander. He asked the commander. So what the word is implying, if nothing else, is that Daniel knew that if they said no, then he would either have to stand and be killed or break and eat the food. So he was asking, and, and as we see it go on here, we'll see that he's, he's going to get, he's actually going to lay out a plan for the underseer not the over, not the, the official, but the overseer that's under the over. Yeah, there's a whole layer here. <laughs> not the, not the general, but the major or, you know. Right. Yeah, it takes a soft approach. And another thing to remember is that when you've made up your mind to do something or not do something, but you know you have to answer to somebody else, the wise thing to do is to ask them in a way that you clearly convey to them that you still think they're in charge. Now, they don't know that your heart has made a decision. I'm not going to do this. So if, if we follow this process and we get to the end of this process and he still requires me to do this, then I'm going to stand. But at this point, he asked permission. The overseer would see it as a proper subservient attitude and would actually, quite frankly, and I know you can all, uh, you can all connect with this, would be more likely to at least give it an audience. So if you, if you come to your parents and you say, I ain't going to bed at nine o'clock. Or you say, Hey, you know, mom, I'm, I'm a little older now. What do you think about considering maybe let me stay up a little longer? I finished my homework by about eight and that only gives me an hour to, to kind of decompress. What do you think? Is mom going to go, that was really awesome. No, go to bed. <laughs> you, you, you see what I'm saying? He's asked, you ask permission. You're trying to get permission from someone that's over you, even though 
In Daniel's heart, it said he had already made up his mind. He had laid upon his heart, I'm not going to eat that food. Now, how can I best get there? Well, I've got an overseer. I'm going to see if he'll help me in this. Maybe he will. A soft answer turns away wrath. Yeah, is that kind of like a soft answer turns away wrath? It can be seen in that way. We could all take a lesson from that, especially on Facebook. (laughs) Enough said. Any other comments? We'll we'll finish up there. Well, actually, we're going to go over a little bit because this is a short one. It's just a marvelous, it's a marvelous answer to Melvin's question. What happens when you do that? Verse 9. Now God granted Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the commander of the officials. God's sovereignty moved the officials. Never forget God is sovereign. The officials aren't sovereign. The king of Babylon isn't sovereign. God is sovereign. He moved the officials over Daniel and his friends to grant the request. We're going to see that. I stole the thunder. You heard the last chapter of this, of this chapter anyway. He, he's going to grant the request, even if reluctantly. It was a remarkable, it was remarkable that these four men, Daniel in this case, would have been given such latitude by someone who was used to killing those who had any dissent with them. Any dissent to what was happening. It was unusual for a Babylonian captor to show compassion to a captive. This was a remarkable demonstration to Daniel and his three friends of the loving care of their God. And they didn't miss it. And later on in their lives, they would evidence their devotion to that God in other ways. So any other comments or questions before we close? Nathal? Correct. Yes. Right. God would have had a purpose, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, whether you, whether you throw us in the furnace or not, we're not going to kneel before the king. And Daniel had said that in his heart. He would have gotten to that. Had the officials said, no, you're going to eat the king's fare, then he would have gotten to that. But he didn't have to. He didn't have to in this case. And he would agree with you today, right now, that yes, whether God delivered him from the officials or not, God was a good God. And whatever God does is righteous and just. But it was really, it had to be remarkable for those men to see that, see God working in their lives that way. Isn't it when it happens to you? Isn't it delightful? Even though when the times come that he, it seems like he isn't acting, we know he is because he has said he is. He has said. He has told us in his word who he is. And that is what we stand on. Thank you for listening to the latest podcast from Kootenai Church. If you'd like to learn more about Kootenai Church or to donate to our church ministry, you can do so online by visiting KootenyChurch.org. We hope you enjoyed this podcast and pray you'll join us again next time. Once again, thank you for listening.